The following message is from King's Church 1066, based in Hastings, Bexhill and the surrounding area. For more information, head to our website, kings1066.org. So one of the things I absolutely love about Jesus was that he told so many stories in parables, but he taught, and that's what it meant to be. Jesus, we've got to remember one of the main things that Jesus was in his time, in his day, was something called a rabbi. He was a teacher. And in a moment, I'm going to um, look at one specific area where Jesus clearly taught his disciples about a few bits and pieces. And um, that's what we're going to go through this morning, which is great. But here's what I want you to do just really quickly. Okay, really quickly. Do you remember when you were at school? Just about. Come on, guys. Do you remember when you were at school? Okay, favourite colour Bic pen you had? Red, green, blue or black? Which was it? Turn to the person to your left or to your right. What was your favourite colour pen that you had at school? Go for it. Quickly. Have a quick chat. Okay, put your hand up. If you're one of them people that used to show off and had all four in one pen, one of the big ones that you had a choice and you could go one, two, three, four. Yeah, I knew it. I knew it. I was one of those. Did you ever try and do two or three at the same time and break your pen? Okay, that was me. That is no bearing on what I'm going to talk about at all, but that's okay. Just thought we'd spend just a minute talking about pens. So my name's Paul. I'm one of the pastors here and um, we're going to continue our nutrient series. You'll see the lovely graphic behind me. And um, actually, that font is the same font as on a pair of trainers I have, which is really quite bizarre. You don't need to know that either. And um, so we're going to continue our nutrient series. And this morning, we're going to look at faith. And, um, but not just faith on its own. I would love to approach the topic from faith and courage. Because when you see Jesus, you see that he led his disciples into faith. But man, did he give them courage. Man, did he draw courage out of them. Faith alone is good. But put your hand up if, as a Christian, you recognise I need courage to do the things that Jesus has asked me to do. Because if I haven't got that, I'm just going to sit there and probably not do much at all. I'm just being really, really blunt. Okay, excuse my Essexness, I'm being blunt this morning. So we're doing a nutrient series. We're going to explain the vital importance of talking about faith and courage as part of this series, where we're giving time, space and energy to look at these four areas to really become part of who we are and to regrow in them, to regrow in them. And there's no better place to look at faith and courage than in the life of Jesus and him teaching his disciples in this wonderful book that we've got called the Bible. Okay? And please don't forget, please don't forget, Jesus is alive. Amen? Jesus is alive and is as real as this metal lectern I've got. It's not an emotional thing that we've made up. He is alive and listening. Amen? Okay. And we are his followers. He is the one we learn from. He's the one we go to. He's the one we listen to. He's the one that we take our lead from. He's the one who sets us our example. We are disciples of Jesus who is alive. Okay. Is that all right? Are you with me? Brilliant. We're going to look at the story of Jesus and Peter. And both of them, both of them walked on water. Both of them walked on water. We're going to be focusing on Matthew 14, 22 to 36. But as in any narrative that you'll find in one of the Gospels, what I find really helpful to do is check that against the other Gospels. You will find... This part of the Bible where Peter and Jesus walk on water in Matthew 14, 22 to 26. But you will also find it in Mark 6, 45 to 52 and John 6, 16 to 24. What I'm going to do, I'm not just going to read out one of those. I'm going to pull them all together. And this morning we're going to walk through the story together. Okay, is that right? So it's going to be slightly different this morning. Just before we get to Jesus and Peter walking on the water, 
in every account, in Matthew and Mark and John, you will see this part of the Bible paired up with another event that takes place. And that other event is the feeding of the 5,000. Okay? The feeding of the 5,000 in all three of those events, that happens. And then Jesus sends his disciples off in a boat out into the Sea of Galilee, and then the walking on the water happens. And they're there together for a really, really important reason that Jesus was trying to teach his disciples something. He was trying to teach his disciples something. So you've got the feeding of the 5,000. Clearly showing Jesus has authority over the natural world and he is more than able to provide for our needs. More than able to provide for our needs, but that is because he has authority over the natural world. It took a few loaves and some fish and made it possible for 5,000 people, 5,000 plus probably people to eat. It's pretty impressive. That's pretty impressive. So before Jesus and Peter walk on water, each part, wherever you see that, you will see just before Jesus feeds the 5,000 and he's showing his disciples that I have authority over the natural world that we live in. Okay? Previously in Matthew 10, Jesus has shown his disciples, I have authority over the demonic and over the sick. I can heal people. And then he says, disciples, now you go and do the same. Now you go and do the same. So he's taught them. They understand he has authority. Jesus gives them his authority. Okay. And then he says in Matthew 10, you go. You go and do it. I've shown you. I've given you the authority. Now you go and do what I have been doing. Jesus shows them, okay, this amount. He shows them this amount. This is how much authority I have. This is what I'm giving to you to go and do. And then in the feeding of the 5,000, it's like Jesus goes from this to this. Not only have I got authority over the sick and over the, over the demonic, I have authority over the world in which we live, the natural world in which we live. And so we come to the time, this story that we're talking about. Have you got that bit, the feeding of the 5,000? Okay, comes to the point now. Jesus is just about to disperse the 5,000 people, okay? And he says to his disciples, go down to a boat, go out into the Sea of Galilee and row to the other side. So as good followers, as good disciples, they do what he said. Jesus disperses the 5,000 people, sends them off. And then the Bible clearly says that Jesus goes off to pray. Jesus goes to pray on his own to his Father in heaven. The disciples are in the boat. The wind is blowing strong. It's clear to see that, okay? Jesus was probably praying for about seven hours on his own before the Bible says he actually goes out to them on the water. And then it's clear to see that they had rowed about three miles. This is a strong storm, okay? You can normally ride, 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 row further than three miles in seven hours. They were going against the wind. The waves would not have been a bit like that. This was a full-on storm they were in. They were probably chucked around, didn't really know what, to, uh, what direction they were going, probably couldn't see land anymore, probably were totally and utterly lost. Jesus finishes praying, walks out to them. They don't know it's Jesus yet. He is walking on the water, okay? Take a minute. Jesus walking on water while his disciples are in a boat. Jesus walks out to them. The disciples see a figure. They don't know it's Jesus. The disciples see a figure on the water. And they're like, what is that? Like, put yourself in their shoes, in the boat. What is that? The first thing they shout out and they cry out is, look out, it's a ghost which is understandable in those times. If anyone, any fisherman, any seaman died at sea, then the thought was the evil spirit or the ghost of that person would stay at sea. 
And so they're probably thinking in the middle of the lake, and this is no small lake, this is a big lake, wind blowing all over the place, their lives feeling threatened. They see a ghost of probably who they thought was possibly a dead person who had died at sea, and they're thinking, it's a sign we're probably going to die. This is, this is the nature of what is actually going on, okay? This is no small storm. This is no small event. These disciples are in a boat, and they are scared, and they are worried. Only when they cried out in fear did Jesus stop and say, take courage. Don't be afraid. It's me. Take courage. Don't be afraid. It's me. What's interesting to note is that in Mark 6, 45 to 52, that account, it actually says Jesus was going to pass them by. Jesus was going to pass them by in the boat and only stopped when they heard him cry, when they heard the disciples cry out. Well, what's that about? Did Jesus not care about his disciples in the boat? Well, he clearly did because as soon as he heard them cry out, he was straight there reassuring, comforting and saying, take courage, I'm here. So he did care. Did he not understand the situation? Of course he did. He was walking on waves. He was right in the middle of it with them. Jesus definitely understood the kind of situation that they were in. So what was going on? Did Jesus hope that his disciples were learning and possibly have learned something from the feeding of the 5,000 account where Jesus was like, I have authority over the natural world we live in. I have authority to provide for your every need. And I wonder if there was something in Jesus that was like, come on, disciples. I may have shown you something back then. What are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with this? Take courage. Do you not remember what I've just done a couple of hours before? Taken authority, fed 5,000 with little, provided for all of your needs. Before, when I've sent you out and given you authority to drive out the demonic and to heal the sick, has it not landed yet that maybe you can do what I'm teaching you to do, what I am showing you can do? I wonder if Jesus was teaching them something, trying to draw something out of them. What time are we on? Well, I've got to hurry up. Here's a bit of an earlier part on the lead up to Matthew 14, okay? Matthew 14. I want to take you back to Matthew 4, just really quickly. Matthew 4, verse 18, tells us that Peter and his brother Andrew were in this exact same lake, but this time they were fishing. They weren't followers of Jesus at this time. They were fishermen doing the family trade. Jesus says, Peter, Andrew, come on. Walking along the side of the lake, he looks out to him, fishing in that exact same lake. Jesus shouts out to him, come, follow me. Straight away, they get out of the boat and they follow Jesus. Has anyone ever found that a bit weird? Why they would leave behind their trade, their money, their security, to straight away get out the boat and follow Jesus. Am I the only one that's ever found that a bit weird? Okay. To me, maybe to one or two others, might be on my own, it seems a bit weird, but not to Andrew and not to Peter. As a Jewish boy, Peter would have grown up in the synagogue, in the educational system, learning the Old Testament word for word for word for word for word. Word for word for word. Okay. That was their educational system. And there were different kind of, well, there were different stages within that educational system. And the more you went on, the more you began to know. And the more you began to know, it showed you had more intelligence, more ability, more of something about you to actually 
grow in understanding the scriptures. And then you get to a certain age. And if you are kind of the most intelligent, like the top 0.2% intelligent, you will go to a rabbi and almost apply and ask to be a follower of that rabbi. And that rabbi would take you under his wing and he would show you anything and everything that he possibly could to live out the kind of things that you've learned from the Bible. Does that make sense? If that young man or whoever it is made the cut, Jesus would turn to him and say, come, no, not Jesus, the rabbi would turn to that person and say, come, follow me. You've got what it takes to follow me. I can see something in you. I can see something in you that you've got what it takes to come and follow me and you can become the kind of person that I am. Come and learn from me more. Let me teach you more. That's what it would have looked like for Peter and Andrew earlier on in their life. So that bit then in Matthew, Peter and Andrew are fishing. That means they were never good enough to be a follower of a rabbi. Jesus comes along, a rabbi, looks at Peter and says, Peter, I know you're probably not the most intelligent. You are who you are, but I'm going to take you as you are and I want you to come and follow me. You haven't made the cut before, that's all right. But I'm asking you to come and follow me because I see something in you. And actually, you can learn from me. I can give you authority. And you can do the kind of things that I am asking you to do. From that moment, from the moment Jesus calls any of his disciples to follow him, he taught them and he released them to go and do the kind of things he did giving them authority to heal the sick, to drive out demons. This is the adventure, the gritty edge of what it meant to be a disciple of Jesus. It's challenging. I want to come back to the story, if I can. Are you with me? Let's come back to the story. I were at the point where Jesus was going to walk past them and... Um, and uh, with all that follow, stuff, follow me stuff that I've just said in mind. Disciples are in the boat, they're tired. Jesus sees them and tells them to take courage, it's him. Peter says, Jesus, if this is you, call me and I will come out to you. What? These are no small waves and they're in the boat and they're getting thrown about all over the place. And Peter's like, I can see Jesus walking on the water. Jesus, if this is clearly you, then tell me and I'm going to come out here. Put your hand up if you definitely would have left a boat to try and walk on water when you saw someone over there. It's gritty stuff. It's gritty stuff. And it's true. It is, it's true. And Jesus says, yes, Peter. Yes. Come out of the boat. Yes. Peter, come to me. Yes, Peter, come and do what I am doing. Yes, Peter. Is that Jesus being, being irresponsible? I don't know. I don't know if he did all of his safety checks. I don't know if he did all of the forms that you have to fill in before you even allow someone to go on a trampoline, let alone call someone out of a boat to say, come on. What's going on? Why is Peter saying, call me out of the boat? Can I come to you? I think for Peter, the penny drops. I want to bring together the story so far. I think the penny drops for Peter. Out of all the people in the boat, one person asked to leave the boat. Something drops in his mind. I think Peter got it. I think he sees Jesus walking on the water. I think he remembered the miracle of 5,000 being fed. I think he sees Jesus' authority stretches over the world that we live in, not that just the demonic and the sick, but he is Lord of all, everything. I think for the first time, the penny drops. The penny drops in Peter. I think he's slowly getting it. 
I think it's going as many Christians, many of us say, going from here to here. I think he's like, oh, wait, wait, wait. Look what he's doing. Look what he's done. And I think they heard the voice of his rabbi saying, come on, Peter, follow me. Follow me. You can do the kind of things I'm doing because I've given you authority. You can do the kind of things I'm doing because I've been at work in your life. I've been teaching you the way to go. I've been modelling it. I've been giving you authority. Come on, Peter. Get out of that boat. Come on, Peter. The pen is dropping. Something's happening in here. Something's happening in here. Get out of the boat. Step on the waves. Get out of the boat. Step on the waves. No wonder Peter had the courage and the faith to step out of that boat with the Lord of all standing on the water saying, come on, follow me. Come on, follow me. Can I come to you, Jesus? Can I do what you're doing, said Peter. And by Jesus saying, yes, he's saying, come and do this in my name and with my authority, Peter. Come on, Peter. I'm giving you that authority. Point two, when a penny drops within the heart of a disciple, that Jesus has all authority, it produces faith. But what needs to be done with that faith? We need to realise Jesus is cheering us on and saying, come on, you can do it. Come on, get out of the boat. I don't know if if Jesus is challenging you in an area or something like that. In terms of faith, hear Jesus cheering us on. Come on. And saying, I've given you the same authority, and so go and do the kind of things that I've been doing to make disciples. And it takes courage. Peter took courage as Jesus told him to and stepped out. Discipleship asks you to be courageous with the faith that Jesus produces in you. Discipleship asks you to be courageous with the faith that Jesus puts in you. Back to the story and round up, okay? The famous bit which Peter's more remembered for. I think he's doing well so far. (laughs) Peter began to notice the wind more and more. He's out of the boat. He's walking on the water. Bible says he begins to notice the wind more and more. And the more he noticed the wind, he began to sink because he was afraid. So he called out to Jesus to save him, which Jesus did immediately. Jesus said to him, you of little faith, Peter, why do you doubt? Question mark. It was a question, not a statement. Peter, why do you doubt? And the disciples welcomed both of them back into the boat. The wind died down. And only then did everyone in the boat say, Jesus, truly you are the Son of God. Truly you are the Son of God. Something at this point has now happened in the lives and the minds of everyone in the boat. So I've often thought about Peter sinking. And I've often thought that Peter gets a bit of a bad time of it because everyone talks about his lack of faith. But what about the faith that he did have? Because he walked on water with little faith. What does big faith look like? What does big faith look like? If little faith and trust in the authority of Jesus allows someone to walk on the water, what would big faith look like? If Peter had never gotten out of the boat, would the other disciples have ever finally realised what Jesus was trying to teach them? And would the penny have dropped in their minds to say, wait a minute, we now remember that. We've just seen Peter do that. We've seen you do this. We've seen you walk on the water. Truly you are who you say you are. Truly you are the son of God. But what about Peter sinking? Okay, Maybe a slightly different way of looking at it. What about Peter sinking? Jesus says it was his lack of faith. But faith in who or what? Faith in who and faith in what? Jesus was clearly doing fine. 
So I'm not sure it was a lack of faith in Jesus. At that moment, he took his eyes off Jesus and noticed the waves. Jesus was doing fine. I do often wonder if Peter at that point was like, can I do the things that Jesus has called me to do? I can see Jesus doing it. Jesus has invited me to follow him. Have I got what it takes? Can I do this stuff? He starts to see all the waves kind of lapping around his feet. If it was me, I'd be like, oh my word, I've started well, but that's getting deeper. Wait a minute. Then waves are starting to make me airy legs get a bit kind of like wetter. And um, what if my trousers and my jeans get wet and they actually start to drag me down? I start to rationalise being out in the water and start to question and start to doubt. So I do wonder if sometimes when I look at this, was it Peter's lack of faith in his own thing of, can I do this? Jesus is doing it. He's asking me to do it. But what I love is going back to the start, Jesus calls him out of the boat and says, come on, try, come on. The moment you sink, I'm going to grab you. I'm going to pick you up and I'm going to take you to safety. But I want to stretch your faith. I want to stretch your courage. I want you to know that I've given you this authority. I want you to know some things. It's a bit of a full on lesson. But Peter realised, got back to the boat and everyone else in the boat realised, truly this is the son of God. Fear and doubt came in, but maybe it was fear and doubt that Peter could do, or Peter was wondering, could he do the kind of thing Jesus was calling him to do? So from here on in, Jesus picks him up, takes him to the safety of the boat and calms the storm. They have safety, time to reflect on what has just happened. And I'm sure that was an interesting conversation. Point three then. We can have trust and faith that when we courageously step out of in faith to do something, Jesus calls us to do. Jesus called Peter. That if we begin to rationalise and question, try and work it all out, try and kind of let like some doubts come into our mind, we can be sure that Jesus will never leave us and has never left us anyway. And that he will come and he will pick you up and he will put you in safety and he will take you to shore. But remember the question, Peter, why did you doubt? Question mark. Jesus isn't questioning the faith he had, but the faith he didn't have. And wanted to draw out of him. Why? And I wonder if Jesus is drawing out questions because all good teachers try and work out what's going on in the life of the person to replace fear with faith and keep them growing and keep them building and keep them courageous and keep their faith increasing. Jesus just didn't leave it there. He kept Peter growing. And you read the rest of the New Testament, you see Peter go, doof, 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 doof learning and growing all the way. I wonder where we need to grow in our belief to allow us to become more like Jesus. And we get the answers from Jesus. Peter continued from this point to grow in faith and courage and trust and understanding. So let's round up. I said that on the last slide. You're probably thinking, Ed Worthy, hurry up, round up. And I've got to go to Bex Hill. What can we take away, okay, from opening up this narrative of Jesus and Peter walking on the water? The first thing is this. Jesus calls you to be a disciple. You. He says, come on, follow me. Come on, follow me. Okay. Hear the voice of Jesus again. Come on. If you've settled in your walk and in your faith and in your courage, hear the voice of Jesus again. Come on. You are not, you're not done yet. There's more to learn. There's more to grow. There's more to understand. 
called to be a disciple. He said, come on, follow me. This means he believes that, cheers you on towards and draws out of you the belief and faith that you can be like him. And this is important because we can clearly see from this that being a disciple is not just an introspective thing. Being a disciple is not just come and change me. Being a disciple is stepping out of the boat in courage to a lost world and doing the kind of thing that Jesus did. If I can boldly, humbly say it's not just about us being a disciple. It's not. Number two, Jesus himself wants us to grow more and more in our faith and understanding that he has all authority in heaven and all earth and on earth. Authority as creator of all things, sustaining everything by his powerful word, sustaining the natural world, authority over Satan and the demonic, authority over the affairs of history, authority over disease, authority over the sinful acts of men, authority over conversion to himself, authority over death and authority over the mission of the church. He has authority. And then the third point, Matthew 28, 18. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded. And surely I am with you always till the very end of the age. An inseparable part of being an inseparable part of being a disciple is that we are caught up and called to be part of the unstoppable mission of Jesus Christ. It's not just about us. That's important, but it's about the world we live in and the kingdom of heaven, which was Jesus' main message of preaching. Hear the voice of Jesus again. Follow me. Come on, follow me. Take courage, have faith. Whole area of discipleship, a fascinating, good, healthy thing to really look at. Jesus, what are you asking me of me? What do you want me to do? Where are we going? To finish off with, I've had something in my mind for a little while. I'm not saying it's prophetic, but I'm going to get you thinking. And if you'd like to, I'm going to leave Sam to do a roundup because I've got to go. I've had this little term going around in my edge about Hastings being, having a gritty edge again. And I had a picture the other day of sandpaper. Sandpaper comes in different grades and gradients. And this is a 40, but the higher it goes up in 80, 100, 120, the smoother it gets, the less gritty it gets. And that's kind of for fine woodworking. And it's challenging me. The grittier it is, the more it takes off. It's, it's got an edge. It's got something about it that can take off the top of the paintwork. It's more effective at doing certain things. I'm reminded that being a disciple is often and sometimes gritty. It takes faith. It takes some courage to make a bit more difference in the town that we live in. It takes a gritty kind of edge and a gritty kind of courage and faith. And I've been challenged myself and just challenged by uh, this preacher been going around in my head for about three or four months. And I'm like, I want to be more like this again. This is a 40 grade and it's really gritty. And even now it's like, oh, it, it, it's, I don't even know how to articulate that. Perhaps it will land on people that are kind of, hopefully it will land on. But courage and faith to go and do the kind of things that Jesus has asked us to do, to bring the gospel to the town that we live in, it will take a grittier edge maybe than some of us have had for a little bit. I'll leave it at that. I'm going to ask Sam to come and follow up. <laughs> Good luck. And um, there's boxes of sandpaper down there if you want to use that in any kind of way. But it, stepping out in faith and courage, if this is something you really want to do, maybe come and grab a bit of sandpaper and just be like, I want to get grittier again. I want to step out in courage a bit more. I want to take Jesus for what he said about authority. And I want to take the step of faith to believe he has given me authority to do the kind of things that he has done. So I'm going to go and I'm going to make a difference. Do you want me to pray? Sam said, I've got to pray. Do you want to stand?
And then I've got go. Jesus, we thank you that you are our teacher. But not only that, you are the King of kings, you are the Lord of lords, you are alive, you are seated at the right hand of the Father and all authority in heaven and on earth is yours. And I thank you that you showed that as you ministered into the life of this planet and humanity and you came to save a lost world and the lost and you accomplished your mission and you left the local church with the call to therefore go and continue the mission that you have asked us to do. And in your authority, Matthew 28, help us understand more and more the authority and give us courage and faith to step out the boat. Talk to our workmates. Pray for people. But ultimately, to carry this area of discipleship of following you to do the kind of things that you did. To go and minister to a world in your name that you are alive and that there is a different kind of life to be led in your name and that God is real and that you can know him through Jesus and there's a whole other kingdom. We ask, capture our heart again and I pray that you would give us a gritty edge of courage and faith to go and do the things and be the people you have called us to be as followers of you. In your name, Jesus. Amen.